wonderful. We're delighted to host this event for a second year. Um, 20 more would be good. Uh, and uh, we think uh, enormously highly of the Chicago Council and its staff and its board. In fact, the chairman of the Chicago Council Board, Lester Crown, a dear friend, was here last week for some meetings, and we were talking about how we intend to co collaborate even more closely than we have. Uh, let me recognize uh, members of the Ambassador Corps, uh, former U.S. Ambassador to Paraguay, uh, Timothy Toll, uh, and let me recognize dear friends who are the panelists uh, for today, uh, including uh, our I think she's our moderator, Jill Doherty, who's right there, a veteran CNN correspondent, Soviet scholar who has returned to her roots to write a book here as a Wilson scholar, a book on Putin. Uh, ambassador Evo Dalder, um, who was our uh, amb U.S. ambassador to NATO, formerly at one of our frenemy think tanks. We won't mention who it is, and is president of the Chicago Council. Uh, and our panelist, Professor Bruce Gentleson, uh, who is a professor of public policy at Duke, former Wilson Center scholar, and working on uh, a book, I guess, Profiles in Statesmanship. Uh, and he wrote a, a, a sort of piece on, on this while here. Um, so today is uh, designed to um, uh, reveal the, the survey results of, of uh, the Chicago Council's annual survey. Uh, they reflect, I don't want to scoop anybody here, but uh, a lot of what I have long been saying and what I said as a nine-term member of the U.S. Congress about, about uh, people in this country. Uh, to me, and I think you'll see this from the survey, the American people are a lot smarter than uh, inside the Beltway types think, and they are paying attention. Americans don't want to disengage, we'll discuss this more fully, they want smarter engagement. They don't want to overstretch, but they want to know that our foreign policy is more than uh, a perception uh, of don't do stupid stuff plus drones. I'm not saying that is the president's foreign policy, <laughs> but I think a lot of people think that is his foreign policy, and some of them are in this country, and some, uh, many of them are abroad. Uh, for 40 years, Americans have been telling the Chicago Council what they want the United States to give the world. They want engaged, informed, diplomacy-first leadership. And diplomacy needs to stress what uh, our citizens and our allies uh, think matters, uh, things like dignity, prosperity, and security. The president, President Obama, speaking in Estonia just a couple weeks ago about, uh, at, the, at the NATO summit, talked about some of these things and why they matter for Ukraine and the rest of the world. The survey was completed in May. Um, but it still resonates. Uh, it resonates despite the fact that there have been major developments, not good, around the world uh, over the, what some have called the summer from hell. Uh, no one has missed the exponential rise of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, ISIL, which has incredible social media prowess, a challenge, Evo, for us. We have to help. Uh, not just our, 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 our uh, think tanks, but our government uh, match and exceed that prowess. We are also now learning uh, just recently about Khorasan, which is an Afghanistan-Pakistan group organized by Khor al-Qaeda to connect uh, foreigners to al-Asiri, the bomb maker in Yemen. Um, this is a really dangerous event, a separate group for the moment from ISIL. Uh, but no surprise to me as someone who has followed uh, these uh, uh, dreadful developments pretty closely over the last several decades. These are urgent threats, but there still is no substitute for a carefully formed strategy that includes the views of the American people. And so now let me just close with my personal rant, uh, which relates to my former employer, the United States Congress. This will only take a few hours. Um, shorthand, uh, duck and blame is not a good strategy for members of Congress. I personally think that Congress's views on ISIL and so forth should be uh, part of this election cycle. Uh, what Congress is likely to do is vote uh, only on what the President has requested, which is to authorize um, uh, uh, the training of 
of uh, uh, it, uh, probably in Saudi Arabia of a fighting force for Syria. Um, but what I do think Congress should do before the election is amend the authorization to use military force to have it apply specifically to ISIL. Uh, I think the, the, the strategy that will happen is Congress will do that after the election. And I think that is better than not doing it. Um, but I, I really believe that for the 535 people who take an oath uh, to protect our country and who um, agree to abide by our Constitution, which gives them the duty to provide for the common defense, they ought to be discussing this now and they ought to be voting on what the uh, framework is for this long-term engagement uh, with ISIL in Iraq, Syria, and other parts of the world. Okay, end of, end of rant. Now for a more serious discussion led by, um, <clears throat> at least initially, by Dina Smeltz, who has two decades of experience in survey research, previously with the State Department's <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Bureau of Intelligence and Research, and now with the Chicago Council. She's had experience on the ground in Iraq, Afghanistan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Cyprus. Now she's going to tell us what it all means. And with that, I'll let Dina and the numbers do the talking and look forward to continuing this conversation uh, as part of our panel. Thank you, and welcome to the Chicago Council. Thank you, Jane. As Jane said, this year marks the 40th anniversary of the Chicago Council surveys, and I'm very excited to share the results with you today. Um, talking heads and even some policymakers tend to talk about American public opinion toward foreign policy as if we have a collective mood disorder, from extreme swings of isolationism to the other end of uh, extreme interventionism. But the truth is, in Chicago Council surveys have shown that American attitudes towards foreign policy are actually pretty stable. For 40 years, Americans have expressed a preference for a foreign policy that relies on multiple means of engagement, ensuring that we remain <coughs> militarily and economically strong, and avoiding military entanglements overseas. That was true 40 years ago, and it's equally true today. This particular question, do you think it would be best for the future of the country if we take an active part in world affairs or if we stay out of world affairs, is a time-honored barometer of American attitudes towards foreign engagement. We at Chicago Council have asked this since 1974, and other polling organizations have asked this all the way back to 1947. <coughs> and you'll see that, in general, about <laughs> six and seven in 10 Americans have supported the United States taking an active part in world affairs. The most recent readings are 58% taking an active part. At the same time in the recent surveys, 4 in 10 now say the country should stay out of world affairs, which is the highest ever. And this increase could lead you and others to come to, to conclude that Americans actually want to disengage. But the full Chicago Council survey results show that this is not the case. Um, Americans are generally similar to the American public at large, but they're more selective about when to engage with economic assistance, with military expenditures, and the use of force. <clears throat> Another key indication that Americans want to stay involved in the world is that large majority since 2002 have supported the United States having strong global leadership. And in a separate question, Americans were asked to rate a series of countries on their influence in the world, and they say that the United States is still the most influential country. So this is a, a, a graph and results that have been really interesting to a lot of people. For the first time in 40 years of Chicago Council surveys, more Republicans, more, more people who describe themselves as, Repub as Republicans and Democrats want to stay out of world affairs. Um, in fact, since 2006, and this is really the important part of this graph, since 2006, the percentage of Republicans saying they want to stay out of world affairs has doubled from 20% to 40%. And independents have similarly grown substantially more likely to say they want to stay out of world affairs. But in general, when you look at the full results, the uh, traditional leanings of 
Republicans tend to still s stay the same, that, that is that they support the use of force, while Democrats tend to support peacekeeping and multilateralism. And independents tend to fall somewhere in between in their views. So a lot of the discussion about Americans' current foreign policy mood really centers and focuses on American reluctance to use force abroad. And especially recently with uh, places like Ukraine, Iraq, and in Syria. And it is true, Americans are fatigued by the war. Seven in 10 say that neither the war in Iraq nor the war in Afghanistan were worth the cost. And it is true that gener generally Americans are hesitant to endorse the use of force. But war weariness does not mean that Americans oppose the use of force in any and all circumstances. They will support the use of force in response to a direct threat, especially if that response is of low cost and low risk, and for important humanitarian purposes. And recent polls, if you've been following them, have shown that uh, Americans do support airstrikes against ISIS, and that follows uh, along these criteria. <clears throat> So these are the top threats that Americans see today. After cyber attacks, they see that international terrorism, nuclear proliferation, and Iran's nuclear program are the most critical threats. Those are the dark bars on the right. They are less inclined to view China's rise, the possibility of the Taliban returning to power in Afghanistan, political instability in the Middle East, Russia's territorial ambitions, and the continuing conflict in Syria as critical threats. <coughs> So remember these rankings because they translate into when Americans will support the use of force. <clears throat> when asked, so this is a question that asks whether people will favor or oppose the use of US <coughs> troops uh, to go to other parts of the world in specific scenarios. And since 2002, seven in 10 Americans would in principle support sending US troops to prevent a genocide and to help with humanitarian crises. That said, public support for specific situations that could qualify in these categories tends to be much lower. For example, when we asked about Syria, only 17% supported sending US troops to Syria. So the specific context of a situation matters. Then keeping in mind the rankings of threats, you'll remember that six in 10 viewed Iran's nuclear program to be a critical threat. And here we see that 69% of Americans support the US troops to stop Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons. Importantly, for these three items in this chart, uh, humanitarian genocide and to prevent Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons, those who said they would like the United States to stay out of world affairs actually support military action in all three of these cases as well. But the support for the use of force does have its limits. Under half would support protecting allies such as South Korea if it's invaded by North Korea, though this is the highest level it's ever been. And under half support sending troops to defend Israel if it was attacked by its neighbors, to be part of a peacekeeping force in Syria, or if Russia invades a NATO ally like one of the Baltic allies. And no more than three in 10 support the use of troops if Russia invades the rest of Ukraine or if China invades Taiwan. So you'll remember terrorism was a, a very critical threat to Americans. Um, six in 10 said it was a critical threat. And reflecting this concern, Americans express a support for a wide range of actions against terrorism. And this was especially high in 2002, right after the September 11 attacks. So currently, 56% of Americans support sending US troops, ground troops, to attack uh, terrorist camps, and you can see by following the dark <coughs> blue line, it was 73 percent um, in 2010. Now it's down to 56 percent, but still a majority. And that's because Americans prefer the lower risk, lower cost approaches of drones, airstrikes, and targeted assassinations. While they're generally cautious about sending troops abroad, Americans still see US military superiority as a very effective way to achieve our foreign policy goals. And in addition to this, majorities have consistently supported 
maintaining our military bases abroad, especially in Japan, South Korea, <coughs> and in Germany. But engagement goes beyond the military. Americans <coughs> say that many other forms of globalization, of global engagement are effective, including existing and new alliances, strengthening the United Nations, strategic uses of sanctions, and free trade agreements. Perhaps one of the clearest signs that Americans value their allies is that they don't support spying on them. Majorities oppose spying on uh, Great Britain, France, Germany, Brazil, Japan, South Korea, and Israel. They're more comfortable, however, about keeping an ear on China, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, and Russia. As much as they value military might, Americans say that economic power is more important for a, a, a country's influence in the world. And despite the effects, and this was surprising, despite the effects of the economic collapse in 2008, large majorities still express support for globalization. In fact, it's the highest it's been, 65 percent. It's the highest it's been since 10 years. And Democrats are particularly supportive, with 75 percent saying it's a good thing, compared to 62 percent of Republicans and 59 percent of independents. Six in 10 also support TTIP and the TPP, which are the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with Europe and Trans-Pacific Partnership with a dozen Pacific Rim countries, <clears throat> which is impressive because none of us have actually seen the text of these agreements. They're, they haven't been made public and nor are they completed. So this really suggests a general positive goodwill about free trade among Americans, rather than the specifics. While trade agreements are seen as effective, so are sanctions. And two in three Americans consider sanctions at least somewhat effective. A majority supports the U.S. increasing economic and diplomatic sanctions in Syria. And other polls have shown that sanctions are the preferred approach to Ukraine, uh, to uh, Russia, in the UK, Ukraine crisis as well. So Americans generally support a diplomacy first approach, but they're willing to back it with force. And Iran is a really good example. Uh, six in 10 favor the interim deal with Iran as worded on the slide. But if Iran commits a major violation of the agreement, majorities not only support increasing sanctions and diplomacy, they also would support the UN Security Council authorizing a military strike against Iran's nuclear facilities. As in the past, Americans strongly support diplomacy even with nations and organizations that are hostile toward the U.S. Since 2008, Americans have said that officials should be ready to meet and talk with leaders from Cuba, Iran, and North Korea, and half even favor talking with the Taliban, Hezbollah, and Hamas. So to conclude, most Americans really don't see foreign policy as optional. They support continued engagement in the world and strong American leadership. <coughs> they have clear views on when it's appropriate to use force. And their preferences are remarkably stable. For a long time now, Americans have supported engagement on diplomatic and economic levels, maintaining military superiority, yet avoiding long-term entanglements overseas. So I hope you will check out the full report on our website. And with that, I will pass the discussion over to Jill. Okay. Well, Dina, uh, thank you very much. That, it's, uh, I think, a, a fascinating survey and something that kind of runs counter to my own impressions, certainly, of what's been going on. I mean, uh, the media and everything that we've read has pretty much said that Americans are becoming more and more isolationist. And in this, uh, the theme, as we discussed even a few days ago, it's stability that Americans are, over a long period, interested in engagement. And yet, Dina, you know, when I was looking at the chart, as, they were, as the two lines were coming together, um, showing that 
uh, the, the people who do not want to engage, let's call it the uh, active participation people, the people who do want to participate, seem to be trending down, and the people who were saying stay out were trending up. But maybe this is another blip, but let's get into it. I know there are a lot of different, very specific areas that we could talk about, but maybe for our initial discussion, we'll keep it kind of broader trends. Uh, and then, of course, we want some discussion from the audience. So uh, let's, let's begin. Eva, th let me begin with you. You know, um, again, that public perception versus what you're seeing right now. I mean, although it was, the survey was taken before the uh, decision about ISIS, ISIL, um, y you certainly did have this perception that people didn't want uh, to get involved in military action. And lo and behold, the polls are showing that a lot of Americans do support some military action. So this is not obviously um, isolationism, and yet it's not complete, uh, you know, let's go and do something uh, from that. What, what is it? I mean, how would you define what the mood and the, and the views are right now? Well, in some ways you can say it's common sense, <laughs> which is to say if you're confronted with a real threat and you are convinced it's a real threat and you believe that you can use military force uh, to deal with that threat, then you're more likely to support it. And indeed, our survey uh, demonstrates that if they think there is a real threat, and particularly if the means of response uh, pose little risk to American servicemen, that uh, um, there is a willingness to, to use force. Um, but there's real limits, because the other thing you do see is not only a war wariness, but frankly in a belief that the large scale uses of ground forces to deal with the problems that we face probably isn't very effective. Uh, Dina mentioned the 71 percent uh, of Americans who now think that neither the Iraq nor the Afghan war uh, were worth it. Uh, the lesson I think they've learned is that this kind of effort isn't very effective to deal with the threat that we're confronting mm -hmm. and therefore we need to look for something else. Uh, and so I think you now have a, a, a sense of where the public is that is pretty much where the policy is starting to lead us, uh, but we have to be careful. Uh, uh, and if you look at headlines in the papers these days of uh, talking about the, uh, a, a war-weary public becoming, exactly uh, the phrase, right? be, be becoming uh, willing to use force and in fact leading the president on the, on the question of ISIS, not so fast. Uh, we have to wait and see. It has to be effective. Uh, don't think that just because there is this support for this particular action at this particular point in time, that tomorrow they will be willing to uh, send 100,000 troops into Iraq or, or Syria uh, because they've made clear they're not. Mm -hmm. Which leads right into that next question, Bruce, maybe for you. Uh, the actual use of force when Americans believe that it is rational, important to use force. Certainly, um, it was interesting that I think the Iran, the, the views of Iran um, uh, struck me as, as very important. But what, would you, what did you draw from this in terms of using sure. force? I think, actually, before I make our remarks, let me just give my kudos to Evo and, and, and Dina and their colleagues for, for a great study. The Chicago Council study has been really valuable over the years for those who study public opinion. Uh, and my thanks to Jane. It's only two plus months since I left the Wilson Center and already missed it, so it's good to be back at least for, for a day or so. Um, you know, I think the, the basic sense, and this actually goes back to when we were trying to figure out after the so-called Vietnam trauma, where is the American public coming from on a whole variety of use of force issues. And I think what we see is they're not trigger happy, and we actually should be worried if they were, given a decade and a half of two very long, at best inconclusive wars. But they're also not gun shy. You know, and I think this sense that you saw in the survey, and as Dina noted, this, the, the data finished in May, so it doesn't even reflect the bump in ISIS. Uh, you know, there was this pragmatism, this prudence that you get from the public that, you know, we're prepared to support the use of force. We're, we're kind of inclined in, those situ in some situations where we believe it makes sense, like to restrain aggression. But if you're going in to remake a government, it makes a lot less sense. Even in August of last year, there was a lot of misunderstanding about the Syria chemical weapons polls. A lot got lumped together, but if you looked at the polls right after the credible evidence on uh, Assad having used, having used chemical weapons, 50% of the public was prepared to support limited strikes. 
was only when the president kind of indicated he wasn't really sure he wanted to do this, he could go to Congress, that it fell off the cliff. So even there, and it, people just constantly say, oh, well, they didn't want to do it a year ago. So I think what you see is an availability of the public. But as Evo said, you, with what we've seen over ISIS, you've got to be careful about the overreaction. You know, I actually find it a little disturbing, the very, very high numbers, mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. One, I don't know what it means to totally destroy ISIS, which is what some leaders are talking about. It's like talking about no, no more crime in American cities. I know what it means to severely degrade them and contain them and push them back. Uh, and even if we were to accomplish goals with ISIS, the issues in the Middle East are much broader than that. The, the, the instability in the region predated ISIS, and it's not just about ISIS. So we need to, as leaders, we need to have people have the big picture. And the second is, um, I mean, I'll just give you an anecdote. I'll stop. I was at an old high school reunion a couple weekends ago. Folks I hadn't seen in a long time. And the guy sitting next to me at dinner said he was supposed to fly to Greece with his family, but he was really afraid to fly because ISIS shoots planes out of the air. And I was like, well, that was, you know, Russia, not ISIS. <laughs> and then he said, well, I'm okay flying in the United States. Well, 9-11 will have, has. So there's a lot of, you know, emotion out there. And leaders really need to shape this so that we do the right thing but we don't feel we have to pick up strategies that, that don't make sense, but there's a sense of a public wave in that direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jane, I want to move to you because obviously with your long background in politics, which you just mentioned, um, we have to look at those intriguing numbers, I think, uh, the political numbers of uh, Democrats increasingly wanting to be more engaged, Republicans looking as if there's less uh, appetite for engagement, and independents tracking kind of what the Republicans are thinking as a whole. I, um, what do you draw from this, and where do you think we are headed with this mentality? Well, I'm not sure I would take that as on, it, on its face. I don't mean that those numbers are inaccurate, but a couple of observations. The president happens to be a Democrat. So I think a lot of the people polled want to support the president. Mm -hmm. And he is, um, depending on how you want to classify him, he's not the most uh, enthusiastic cheerleader for military action, but he is now moving toward a uh, nuanced campaign, including military action, because the threat has increased. I actually support the way he's doing that, although I think Congress needs to authorize the action more later. Uh, but so there's that. On the independents and the Republicans, there is a, uh, a growing number of independents in this country. I think that reflects two things. One, people are absolutely sick of the toxic partisanship of our politics. That includes me. And they, they really hate it, and they're leaving both parties to become independents. That's sort of one piece of the independent movement. The other piece is uh, a, a sort of a more libertarian piece. Um, people want government to do less. And that could be reflected in these numbers. Uh, they just want, want it to do less. And then there are Republicans. And I think the Republican Party is shrinking. I'm not sure, but I, I do think that's true. So I, I think if you look at these numbers, Democrat, independent, Republican, I'm sure they're accurate for what the poll says. But I don't think they really reflect why people in those categories are doing what they do. Uh -huh. What about the threats themselves, Evo? I noticed um, cyber threats, the most critical, even more than terror and Iran. Um, what does that say to you? Well, in part because I think anybody who in the first half of this uh, year was paying attention knew that Target uh, and, and now Home Depot and other credit cards are being stolen. Uh, China. Uh, Russia and others are engaged in cyber, uh, cyber behavior, offensive cyber behavior that, that is affecting the daily lives of average Americans in one way or another. So it's understandable uh, that given that kind of uh, notoriety of what is happening that it would be put high uh, in, in, in these circumstances. But I think at the same time it's very interesting to see that the other major threats are the ones that we all talk about. They are terrorism. Uh, proliferation of, of nuclear weapons, particularly to hostile states, uh, and, and Iran. And, and I think if there's one big finding coming out of this, this study, it's the one on Iran. Uh, they are focused on it. They understand the, the threat that it poses. Uh, they are engaged and supportive of a negotiated settlement uh, that is currently being uh, conducted by the administration. And they're prepared that if it doesn't work, 
to take the military option. Uh, that is, you know, frankly, I think that's the right policy, uh, but it is, it's good to see that very large majority, 69% of the American public are willing to use military force, not only force, U.S. troops uh, to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. That is a remarkable, when you think about it, a remarkable statement of understanding threats that are confront the United States and being willing to do something about it. Uh, Bruce, uh, picking up on that point that Ivo made about um, how you use military force, whether it's boots on the ground or whether it's drones, as you looked into this a little bit more, do you see um, any divergence or, or like fine-tuning of how Americans look at something that would be um, uh, you know, less dangerous for forces? Yeah, and they're very reluctant for boots on the ground. You know, the notion of Nikes on the ground, special ops is a different, kind of an in-between uh, area. Um, and I think, again, it's sort of the, there's this old expression from Elmo Roper, you know, back in the 1940s, he's talking about the common sense of a common man, common woman, in which, you know, we were talking about this over lunch, people sort of get it in a certain way that sometimes we, whether academics or, or people in the policy community, we're looking for them to use different language, but they have this basic understanding that you use military force for military objectives, right? And you don't use it as much for political objectives, right? Unless it's linked to a serious diplomacy. Uh, and so what they're looking for here, I think, is what are our assets, what seems to work. Uh, I think they have a realistic sense of what working means. You know, it's not like World War II where you, you get a decisive victory. So it is very rare when people come out to, to support the use of, of, of ground forces. I think in the Iran numbers, when presidents take a position, it has sort of a queuing effect, and it's usually good for about 7-8% in public opinion. And President Obama has not specifically said ground troops, but he's been very you know, consistently stating that we're prepared to use force in Iran, and I think that that's reflected there. Some of the other issues, you know, he hasn't been as explicit on, and um, the problem, of course, is that might be day one, but on day 45, if it's not working, you can't guarantee that the public is there, so you better make sure, I think Evo said this before, that you have a strategy that works, because you've got to worry about not just this new cycle, but a bunch of those to come. Mm -hmm. Um, Jane, could I ask you, um, the jobs part of it, obviously this is always a major theme and it is here again, the highest um, foreign pro policy priority, 76 percent uh, say that that is one of the most <coughs> important things, helping to, and uh, just one in four say protecting weaker nations against foreign aggression is, is as important, it's 25 percent supporting protecting weaker nations. So is this Americans looking at themselves? I mean, obviously every country is in it for itself, but, but uh, can Americans broaden their scope, do you think, according to this, to other concerns of countries in well, trouble? Well, let's remember the old political adage, it's the economy, stupid. And it is a centerpiece. In fact, it, it, it should be a centerpiece of this election, this midterm election, let alone the 2016 election. Uh, but I, I found, it, you didn't specifically ask about trade, but I found the numbers on trade fascinating. Here you had more Democrats than Republicans supporting trade. Um, to remind everybody, and I was one of the pro-trade Democrats, it wasn't exactly a real popular position with a lot of the labor unions. Mm -hmm. uh, not that organized labor uh, occupies the bandwidth it used to, but it's still out there and it can mobilize voters. So to have Democrats be pro-trade and Republicans less so was fascinating. I do think a trade agenda is a really smart piece of international engagement. Uh, everybody wins with a well-constructed, fair trade agenda. Uh, in we win, uh, the, the, the group we're in that's trading with somebody else wins, and the somebody else wins. And uh, over time, building economic relations is the best way to prevent uh, needless wars. So this is a... Uh, a very positive way to go, and, and, and the, uh, the survey showed this. In terms of, uh, maybe you were also implying, Jill, people are focused at, on jobs at home and they just want to check out of, the, of an international agenda. Well, I, again, I think a lot of those jobs at home, whatever they may be, depend on an international agenda uh, because of where the raw materials come from, where the markets are. Uh, and uh, where the workforce comes from. So we, I don't think we can have an America-only jobs agenda that's a growing agenda. 
-hmm. And uh, I, think, I think that came out in the survey. I just want to add one thing because I was listening to what Bruce said. Uh, presidential leadership matters here. Uh, if you just poll on 20 issues, people might say, I like issue A better than issue C. Um, but the president does set a large part of this agenda. He or she hmm, has a big bully pulpit and can frame this. And that's why I think uh, Iran, as Bruce pointed out, maybe has a higher point value than some other issues. I personally think on the merits it ought to have that. Uh, but let's see, after the summer from hell, whether Iran, if this survey were held again, might be a question to ask you guys mm -hmm. now in September, not that it wasn't good in May, but hey, uh, would, would Iran still have higher numbers than uh, maybe some of the other topics like terror, terrorism, given ISIL's rise? Yeah. Actually, that, that's an excellent question. Maybe, Evo, do you, well, I, uh, what's your guess? Uh, my guess is that Iran wouldn't go down, but ISIS would have gone, come up in mm -hmm. part because of what both you, uh, Jane, and, and, and Bruce said. I mean, when presidents speak and make up their mind, it does matter. It, it, it solidifies opinion. Um, uh, and that's why, that's why it's so interesting in some ways to look at the data today, given that it was really done, the survey was done in May. It, it, if, if in May people had said, the president actually can go out and make the case that ISIS, that there is this threat in the Middle East, and, mm -hmm. and make airstrikes a central part of a larger strategy, the American public would have supported it we would have been laughed out of the room because the consensus in May was that the American public was ready to go home, stay home, put guards and gates up, and leave the rest of the world uh, for other people to be to, to dealt with. And these data just show that's just not an accurate picture of how to think about the American public, not only on the question of the use of force, which in and of itself is important, but on the whole series of issues to see the highest pro-globalization or belief that globalization is basically a good thing ever is pretty remarkable after yeah. we've come out of a, uh, the worst uh, economic recession since the 1930s. The same on trade, uh, the same on keeping forces overseas, uh, on alliances, on maintaining American military superiority, and having defense spending. Uh, all of those believing that treaties are a good thing. All of those are indications that this is a public that understands, as I think Dina put it well, foreign policy is just not, is not an option. It's something that you have to do. Uh, and they're prepared to do it. You know, they'd like others to do a little more of it, uh, which uh, is, is a good thing. But they're not willing to say, it's your problem. We're going home. You figure it out. Mm -hmm. Let me just comment. I, I think that's really important because I think earlier in the year, there was developing this conventional wisdom that the public is isolationist. And we saw it on the Democratic left and on the Republican right. It was like blaming the American public. We, we, we would have a good foreign policy if the public would just let us. And we first saw this data, I think, in early June. Uh, Tom Mann w w was on the you know, advisory group, myself and some others. And you know, so before ISIS, and the data was basically saying at the Chicago Council that, sure, that f it's 58 to 41 now, the gap is smaller, but 58 was still a big deal. And in some respects, that's really important because it puts it back, the public is kind of available. Again, it's not gonna do everything, but it's waiting for its leaders, especially, you know, not only this summer, but it, you know, we're living in one of these periods of huge transition. There's so many changes in the world. And they're looking for some sense, you know, academics call it a paradigm, communicators call it a frame. I just sort of think of a big picture. You know, they want their leaders to help them sort it out to put the pieces together a little bit, and then they're prepared to say to their leaders, you've got our confidence, you know, to go do some things. And, and that's where they are. They're not running away from the world. They're confused by it and a little scared, but they get it. And in some respects, if you recognize that they're not isolationists, the problem is actually, I think, with leadership, not conveying the American public policies that make sense to them. It reverses sort of the flow and puts the burden on not just, not just the president, but Congress, people, all of us who try to speak and write on these things. Uh, and, and that's a very different sense than one got earlier in the year, just which was just kind of blaming the public. Mm -hmm. You know, I was really struck as I read this by uh, the fact that, like, internally, emotionally, only 24% of Americans believe that the U.S. is safer than before 9-11. And that seems to, to um, almost run counter to this openness to engagement, which kind of surprised me. In other words, the... Um, fear that Americans may have, and yet, is is it 
uh, correct to interpret it as they are willing to look beyond that to engagement, Eva? Well, I, I, so those, those data are interesting. 48% think we're as safe as we were before 90, before 9-11. So 72% of the American public, <laughs> which is, I think is actually, that's a stunning number, uh, okay. now thinks that we are either safe or a as safe as before 9-11. And in some ways, that's, uh, you know, I think that's an interesting hmm. finding uh, and reflects what we have done over the last um, 14, 13 years with regard to homeland security and our intelligence and the kind of effort, whatever they think on Iran and, and, and uh, on Iraq and Afghanistan, that somehow that investment, which has been extraordinary on the part of this country uh, in terms of lives and, and treasure, uh, is starting to pay off, and uh, I was reading recently some some reporting back in the late part of nineteen of two thousand and one and early two thousand and two, and you had this this sense of there was something coming at you almost any minute, and and it w and that's gone, and people now walk the streets, uh, not worrying about this threat in the same way, uh, and I think so. You have a, a sense of safety, concern. Still, and when there is a threat, they want to deal with it, which is why uh, the, I, the rise of ISIS has, uh, has mobilized opinion and the way that ISIS communicates uh, makes it even more likely that people get mobilized. Um, uh, <coughs> but, it, but it reflects a basic sense, we're okay. It's, it's, going, or it's going all right. Uh, and so why don't we continue uh, down the path of, of, of engagement? One um, country that popped out at me a little bit of a different approach here, uh, China. You know, I would always expect China, uh, especially a few years ago, as you point out in the study, to be one issue that Americans are concerned about, certainly economically, uh, concerning jobs, et cetera. But it, in the study, it says only 41% see the rise of China as a critical threat compared to minorities back in the mid-1990s. So, I mean, maybe everybody can jump in, but it's such, you know, the, the role and the rise of China is so important. Mm -hmm. And to see that that is somewhat diminishing, diminishing, is it because there is so much else out there? Or is there actually a little bit more um, moderate view of China as another uh, powerful country? Well, demonizing China has been a sport in both political parties. Uh, and it's a pretty dangerous sport. Um, the, the amount of real knowledge, again, coming back to Congress about China, is uh, less than ideal, um, which is one of the reasons why uh, the Kissinger Institute on China in the U.S. at the Wilson Center is so important. <laughs> mm. uh, thank you, Jill, for the softball. <laughs> but uh, I think the poll actually just reflects the fact that, that these other issues are much more in the news. It's, it's, not, it's not based on a nuanced sense of where China fits into the rest of the world. And, and oh, by the way, we were just talking about presidential leadership. I do think that's a responsibility of a president to help order these, these different challenges. Uh, we have to be able to walk and chew at the same time. It is not true that the only issue confronting the world is ISIL. Uh, anybody heard of Russia, Ukraine? It's sort of out there. And a lot of other things that were on this poll. And I. Uh, you can't get the pecking order right at all times, but America's response has to one place has to link to another place. It's absolutely critical that we do this, and let's remember that the other big players uh, in the same meetings about the problems are Russia, China, et cetera, et cetera, and so the issues concerning Russia, China, et cetera, et cetera, have to sort of be uh, on the chessboard. I mean, someone has said this is three-dimensional chess. It's probably four-dimensional chess, if I could imagine what that means. Um, but it is. It's not, it, this is not linear. And uh, not only does the world not communicate in a linear way anymore, uh, it's completely uh, 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 linked and networked, uh, but foreign policy problems are linked and networked. Mm -hmm. There's a related question where people, I can't remember the data, uh, is the United States as important a world leader or its power the same as it was 10 years ago? And most of the people said no which I don't think is defeatism or pessimism. I think it's pragmatism, right? The world has changed. Doesn't mean China is dominating. Uh, it is a different world. And I was actually glad to see that because you know, all these appeals to, that we make, um, the American public gets it. That if you ask them, are we still the most powerful leader in the world? I think they still said yes. 
So I actually think that common sense comes through there. We're not as powerful as we were 10 years ago, not just because of China, because it's a very different world. There's, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things going on, and it's, it's pleasing to see that they, in their own way, get that point. Mm -hmm. I want to move to questions pretty soon, but just a, a bit more on the issue of shared leadership. Mm. Uh, obviously, Americans support it, um, believe in multilateral uh, alliances, and yet, Obama has been criticized quite a lot for leading from behind, um, going to the United Nations, trying to get these alliances with other countries, and not just going in there and really doing it. Now, granted, that could be a minority position, but it's, it's a strong one, and it's out there. So how do you square that? Well, I, I think the data show uh, that there is a difference between leadership and going it alone, and Americans uh, like leadership, they want the the president of the United States to be a leader, but he also but be part bring along a lot of other people as part of that. Uh, so you see very strong positive views of going to the United Nations and working with the United Nations, and understanding that working with others may sometimes mean that it's not exactly what you set out to do that we will come out. It's something that we come uh, come together on. Uh, trade and alliances, uh, which have very strong support, show that there is a willingness, indeed an eagerness, to, to work with other, with other countries. So I, I think in part the criticism uh, that one may hear is out there, uh, and that may reflect a minority opinion in the public, but the public understands uh, that when it comes to dealing with international problems, it's far preferable that the United States do it together with other countries than if we have to do it on our own. Jen, did you have something? Well, a couple of comments. First of all, Evo knows NATO better than I do, but the, what's been going on in Ukraine uh, has, many think, uh, given NATO a renewed focus. And as a defense organization, which we belong to, it's a pretty darn important defense organization. And watching uh, that NATO summit, I thought was, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> for once, uh, a, an encouraging story, seeing a number of people step up and making it clear, and the president chose to go to one of the former uh, Soviet states um, to, to deliver an address. I thought that was impressive. So there's one alliance that I think now has uh, uh, more vigor. But I was going to say, in terms of working with others, when you talk, of, just to focus on ISIL for a moment, uh, ISIL is anti-Muslim. Everybody ought to get that. It's certainly anti-Sunni, which is a huge part of the Muslim religion. But it's anti-Muslim. Who are the people ISIL's killing? It's beheading a few Western reporters and threatening to attack the West. But it's operating in Muslim countries. And its ambitions are to basically take them over, throw out everyone who doesn't agree exactly with them, and establish this seventh century caliphate. It's the irony of using most, the most modern uh, social media tools to achieve the seventh century is kind of weird, but mm -hmm. hey. So how do you defeat an anti-Muslim group? You'd think that the face of the, of the activity against it ought to be Muslim. And, and we are trying. We, not just uh, President Obama, but those who are like-minded, are trying to build on the ground a Muslim face fighting against this group, whether it's um, Sunnis who are uh, finally reawakening. They already awoke once in Iraq, but reawakening in, uh, in Syria or in, in the region, or uh, even she uh, and Shia, who obviously don't like ISIL, which is a, a Sunni group, and others to uh, push back. It, you know, the, 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 the campaign against it, whether you want to call it defeat, destruction, or whatever you want to call it, is not going to work without, mm -hmm. without the local populations pu pushing back. So, so my point is those alliances are critical to the, to the goal of the mission. Mm -hmm. Bruce, did you have something? Sure. And then we'll open up for it's, questions. You know, it's, it's the pragmatism again. Part of it, I go back to the 1970s, is the burden sharing argument, the economic. You know, I mean, when Jim Baker did his 10 cup exercise for the Gulf War, is to demonstrate that particularly those that were not sending troops were, you know, providing some of the financing. So some of it's burden sharing. But I think the point that both Jane and, and Evo made, it, it's also about, you know, you can't get it done on your own. Right. It's like in trade, there's you know, sort of every there's a theory of comparative advantage. Everybody has a different advantage. In alliances, every everybody brings something else to the table. Right. So in ISIL, you know, I think the sense is that w people don't want us to do f to do this for those countries, but with the countries, and they bring certain things to the table that we don't. Whether it's the indigenous forces or the UAE or Jordan or Turkey, or whatever. 
And it just makes sense in terms of almost sort of a, you know, a team concept, right? That, that you really need serious partners. Frankly, on our part, we also need to be willing to, to give people significant roles, you know, uh, uh, in that respect. But you just can't win by, by doing that. And I think the public really gets this. I think some of the political rhetoric, you know, you know, seizes on, I mean, leading from behind was a terrible expression, you know. But I think that's not what's being done here. It's leading with others. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think maybe we'll open it up for some questions uh, from the audience. And uh, we have some microphones out there. And of course, the request is that you identify yourself and ask a question, um, hopefully not, uh, <laughs> not preach, <laughs> which occasionally happens. I do it myself. But uh, could we, there's a gentleman right here in front, if you could get a mic down there. Thank you. I'm Tom Mann, and I admit to having served on the advisory <laughs> committee oh, for this fine. survey, and kudos to uh, the staff, Dina and Evo, and everyone else involved in it. But I, I want to ask what I hope is a, a bit of a provocative question. Um, what you've said is very reassuring uh, today, reassuring about the American public, about the possibilities of of taking on this, this new uh, expanded responsibility in the Middle East, particularly in Syria, and, and at least hopeful about the possibility of the public being willing to go along with it. Um, and I'm, I'm just struck by how different that would be from everything happening on the domestic arena where we have absolutely strategic opposition from the out party to anything the in party in the White House wants to do. And so the leadership going out to the public is, is very much divisive, oppositional, polarizing. Are you confident um, that the out party would have the patience to stick with an administration undertaking a task that will take years, uh, not months. Is there really enough there uh, in the public that isn't so partisan that would al allow that to happen? Okay, provocative. Who, who wants to jump in uh, first? I'll, I'll uh, try. Uh, first of all, Tom, thank you for your generation of, you know, decades of work on Congress. You haven't fixed it, but <laughs> you certainly have studied it. Um, I. I don't actually read what Congress is doing the same way. I think Congress is playing what I call the duck and blame game mm -hmm. and letting the president take the risk and then blaming the president if things go wrong is what's underlying, I believe, uh, the, some of the support he's getting. Uh, I don't think that's responsible. Uh, we actually had um, a Bob Corker here about a year ago talking about the need to revise, reform, replace the AUMF and he talked about a feckless Congress and how irresponsible it was. So uh, there are some in both parties who think this, in addition to me, I'm now nonpartisan. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think um, it's not good enough just to say, okay, do it. We'll, we'll pass this very limited authorization to train uh, uh, some, some troops. Uh, I don't think that's good enough. I think Congress ought to decide what what it are the contours of this action, this long-term strategy, which, as you point out, will go on for years, and, and do robust oversight to make sure that the executive branch is following the uh, legal authority given by Congress. Now, how do you map that out over years? It's tricky. Uh, you, you give some broad authority, you define what the targets are and, and, and what the end game is and uh, what, uh, what the tools are. But the tool should not just be military force. I don't think anybody, including anyone who voted on the survey, would believe that. Uh, but Congress doing that, it seems to me, uh, would be uh, real support for what the president's trying to do. What Congress is doing right now, I think, is just uh, jockeying for the election season. And uh, I surely hope that Steny Hoyer is right. He was quoted in a couple of articles yesterday and today and I've actually talked to him about this, that after the election, this election, five weeks from now, uh, there will be a, is it only five weeks? Mercifully, six weeks from now. Uh, there will be an engagement by Congress and a real focus on, on, on granting or not granting uh, authority for the mission. 
Okay. Uh, I just, uh, a adding to that, um, I think it would be a mistake if we assume that what the current public mood when it comes to the use of force with regard to ISIS is going to stay forever. Right. And I think uh, we are risking over-interpreting mm -hmm. the, sh the, the so-called sh uh, shift in the past couple of weeks in the same way we were over-interpreting the reluctance to use force that we were seeing right. earlier on. Uh, that support is highly conditional. Uh, it is conditional on success. Mm -hmm. And it is conditional on not escalating in a way that, that, that would involve uh, a, lot more, uh, a lot more risks to American forces. So the idea that we could go on and bomb and it's not really working, so let's try something else like troops <laughs> that already is now being uh, raised in certain circles, uh, nothing in these data suggests that the American public would be supportive of that. Indeed, everything suggests that they would be against it. Uh, and I think in, in the debate that we've seen, the swing that we've seen over the past two weeks, uh, it, it would be a terrible mistake to say, oh my God, the American public is more hawkish than the president. Everybody will come along and that that will last for longer than Mm -hmm. uh, the success of the policy that we have right but now. But P.S., if we're attacked domestically by somebody who allegedly is linked to ISIL, then, yeah. uh, then you'll have an equal. Then, right. then we may have a huge pendulum swing, which is again why I, a framework needs to be put around this. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, if I were a cynic, and of course I'm not, um, I would think that some of the calls for ground troops coming from certain elements of the other party are knowing that they won't work and trying to create a difficult political situation. I would only say that if I, if I were a cynic, but of course I'm not. But anyway, that's, um, but, I, but I think that the question is, you know, the notion that the public will judge on the basis of success makes perfect sense, right? It's like the key thing with public opinion use of force is if you feel that you're pursuing a strategy that's not working yet, but has prospects of success and the public abandons you and you have to abandon it, it's like an investment in the market, you take it out too soon. But if you're pursuing a strategy that's not working and keeping it any longer is not, you know, going to work, then the public is actually right about that. I think, you know, um, and I think that that's, that's the difference you have to make. The other point is, you know, if a president is truly committed to a, a policy uh, and can continue to convey to the public, which is why you don't oversell it at the beginning. You know, you set some bars. Whatever you say in this news cycle is going to be there a few news cycles out. You get that bump for a while. And you know that you don't always need 60% support. You just need to avoid 60% opposition. And that's part of being president, the discretion you have in foreign affairs <coughs> and domestic, especially in a second term. So <coughs> there is some flexibility, but it's not, you know, it's not a blank check that they'll stay with them no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there other questions? Um, yes, sir, in the back on the left. Hi. Uh, Phil Schrafer, uh, no affiliation <laughs> at all. I do. I have to say, I do have a friend who's trying to write an article on Putin. But my question is about Russia for, for Jill or anybody else who wants to contribute. Uh, what would this survey say uh, about the public's view towards Russia? I mean, there are some Republicans who are saying that if Romney ran in 2016, he would win because he said that uh, Putin's a leader of this evil empire. My only comment there is this in interesting evil empire that helped us get chemical weapons out of uh, uh, Syria and is helping us supply our troops in Afghanistan and is in a joint space program. Mm, thank you. Eva, what are the top points, th do you think, on Russia? Well, interestingly enough, the, the public is soured on Russia. Uh, uh, and so uh, we, we do a barometer where you rate people on a scale from, from zero to 10. They're, they're now at 30, uh, three point, or 30, from zero to 100. So they're at 36, which is the same that they were during the Cold War. Okay. So in the last 25 years, this is the lowest level uh, with regard to Russia uh, that we have seen. And again, the survey was done in May uh, in the middle of the Ukraine um, uh, news, news cycle, so to say, and without any other distraction. So it shouldn't be terribly surprising that that's where uh, the public is. That said, uh, they're not prepared at all to use force, for example, to come to the aid of Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, even if, if Russia were to escalate, which of course it has done since that time. Mm -hmm. And there was another man right back there. Yes, sir. Uh, Ron Davis, former uh, State Department. Um, 
What do you think your polling would show if uh, the, some of the questions uh, were aimed at uh, calling for more personal sacrifice, such as a uh, perhaps a war tax, a mandatory mm -hmm. payroll deduction mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. war tax, or some form of conscription? Because I don't think your questions ask for much sacrifice. Very, very interesting question. I, Bruce, let's let's hear from you first. I don't think the threat is at that level. I mean, I'm really not of the of the depicting ISIS, you know, as a threat, anything close, or even, you know, I think Russia is doing some really bad things. I don't think it's like the Cold War where you had a nuclear confrontation and a global struggle. My own view was I think the public was prepared for that after 9-11. You know, I think the public understood that was a threat to the homeland uh, rather than go shopping and keep taxes out. I think the public was prepared for that at that point. So it's really proportional to, to the nature of the threat, not only its immediacy to people, but the scope of it. Um, and so I, I don't think that that would be, um, if, if it escalated, you know, it's a different story. Uh, but I, I don't think that's really the issue for people right now. Uh, uh, even economically, I mean, there'll be some budget issues that are associated with this. Uh, but we've got bigger problems with the budget than, well, but than just that. Uh, let me disagree a little bit. Um, you know, the, our in involvement in Iraq cost a trillion dollars uh, with a T. Uh, and most of it was considered emergency spending off budget. One of the reforms that Congress actually undertook, right, Tom, was to put war spending on budget. However, no one is talking yet about the cost of this ISIL strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is one of the things Congress needs to get at. I mean, there is a war tax. Our uh, um, income tax dollars are paying for this. Uh, where do you think it's being funded from? I mean, I don't know of anybody robbing banks to pay for this or are stealing uh, oil platforms the way ISIL is paying for its own stuff. Deficit. So, uh -huh. deficit. deficit. Well, so we're paying for it, and and I do think Americans have to understand the cost of these engagements. And again, it's another argument for Congress uh, robustly uh, getting into this and for the president putting this forward. He he hasn't said the duration, which I think is hard to predict, or the cost yet of this, except to ask for $5 billion for counterterrorism funds, something that I personally think is legitimate and that Congress can debate, and to ask for, I think it's $500 million for this training operation. Any more questions? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. I'm Jim Shu here at the Wilson Center. Uh, and again, thanks to the panel for a very stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, based on the research done in the survey here, um, how might you think our public opinion would react to two big what ifs? First of all, if there was a huge um, economic downturn due to something connected to globalization, I'm thinking the Chinese housing bubble bursts and a huge uh, setback globally, economically. Uh, I noticed the strong support for trade agreements, but would that survive? And secondly, in a, um, more on the ISIS-ISIL front, if the foreign fighter issue goes beyond and metastasizes beyond the hor horrific beheadings, uh, but becomes one where we worry about the flow of foreign fighters in from our country, I was in Minnesota recently driving through Minneapolis on the same day that appeared a headline from Minnesota to militancy um, in the Washington Post. Um, how might that affect uh, U.S. domestic opinion on uh, sectarian and ethnic balances within our own countries? Thank well, you. That's a natural for you. Do you have thoughts? <laughs> Really? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Just to point out, a Wilson scholar asked these brilliant questions. Um, a crystal no, I, I think there, I, so I, I think, you know, it's difficult to speculate. Uh, and, and in my former job, I could always say I don't, you know, I used to answer hypotheticals when I was a scholar of the Brookings, but now I can't. Uh, I can't say that anymore. So I, I think if you, the, the premise of the question is important on, on, the, um, on the globalization peace, um, because we didn't see an anti-globalization wave 2008 onwards. But if it is something that happens overseas and has a very negative impact on our economy here at home, then I think logically you would say people, let's find a way to 
to guard ourselves against that. So you would think uh, that a more protectionist uh, view would emerge. That that would be my uh, my counter hypothesis. On the question, uh, I'll answer slightly differently. I don't know what the answer would be in terms of sectarian or views internally to the United States. But if the threat from ISIS came home directly, then I think there will, particularly if, if it comes home in, in, in really uh, uh, large numbers, so the number of casualties are, are very significant, uh, then I think in a reaction not that different from where we were in 2001 would be likely. Um, hopefully with some lessons of the lessons learned of the past decade, because we have learned a lot of lessons, even if we haven't yeah. written them down. I think, Jim, you may be writing some of those lessons here. So we're looking forward to that. But it is, um, uh, uh, we have learned, and I think the American public has learned a big lesson, which is the idea that throwing military force at, uh, and remaking an internal structure of a country just isn't a very viable prospect. Uh, and uh, so they may be willing to throw more military force at it, but not for that purpose, more for the purpose of defeating the actual you know, I wanted to, to end on this question, so it's a good kind of summing up. And Bruce, please do uh, tell us, you know, your so, crystal So Jim, on the sectarian part, you know, I, I, I share a concern. I mean, historically, we had the Japanese Americans put in internment camps, you know, uh, because of their identity in World War II. You know, Germans and, Cap Germans and Italians had some bias. And, and, you know, there could be this, you know, demagogues who foment that. You know, and so I think it's, it's very dangerous. I think I'd say, it, you know, it's true of a lot of countries, but I think historically we have had sort of a tendency when feeling a threat, you know, to single out groups. And I, and I, I was actually very pleased and proud how we managed that right after 9-11. I think it took a lot of leadership, both sides of the aisle, a lot of local leaders, leaders of the Muslim American community. But I, I, I you know, if that started to happen, you know, it's a real risk we run, and that would be a great, that's beyond public opinion to a great concern. But lessons have been learned, uh, and I think people looking back, I've certainly been on many panels looking back at what we did on 9-11, people look, understand the context, but have done some course corrections for some of our policies, which perhaps moved the pendulum too far in one direction. Surely, uh, President Bush acted without consulting Congress on a lot of those things. He used his commander-in-chief authorities. Lesson to this president and future presidents, and lesson to all of us. We want the separation of powers to work. It wasn't working there for some years, so that's a lesson. But when the Boston Marathon bombing happened, um, it was a much more contained reaction. I mean, Boston's strong. There was resilience, which we didn't mm -hmm. demonstrate on 9-11. Also, let's understand that for 13 years, our, com our country has been relatively safe. Some plots have been foiled. There have been a few attacks that have been gruesome and awful, uh, some inspired specifically uh, by uh, some of these al-Qaeda members and others. Uh, but again, they have been contained because law enforcement is better trained and understands how this stuff goes down. And there is no such thing as 100% security. That message has to be communicated. They have to be right once. We have to be right 100% of the time. Forget about it. Uh, can't happen. So uh, I think in the net, um, with, with the problems we have, with the enormous threats posed by ISIL, and I don't minimize them in the slightest, and the fact that people with uh, foreign passports are signing up, that's what I meant by the social media war. We have to get better at that. But I think in the net, uh, we are uh, a stronger country uh, and, and a safer country. Well, I want to wrap up here and thank very much uh, the panel. I think it was really an excellent panel. I was thinking, you know, d diplomacy, public policy, Congress, and then also foreign policy in general. And, and you all, each of you brought a lot to this. It's a great survey, and I recommend reading it carefully. It's uh, very, very worthwhile. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.